Hello and welcome or welcome back to my channel. My name is Meredith. Welcome. If you cannot tell by the title of today's video, I am doing a, another true crime case today. I'm doing a serial killer case. This case is very crazy and a lot happens in a short amount of time. We're just gonna dive right in. This is the case of Britain's very first female serial killer, Mary Ann Cotton. This case takes place in the 1800s, so over a hundred years ago. It was very shocking to Britain and all over the world because back then women were seen as less than of a man and we've evolved so much within the last hundred years it was just so shocking to everyone that a woman who seemed so well put together and independent could do all of the horrible things that she did especially to her loved ones and family members so without further ado let's get on into today's crazy case so this case i'm just gonna do a little background on mary and kind of how she grew up and her childhood and how she came into her life and the events that take place in today's case. So Marianne Cotton was born on Halloween, October 31st in 1832 to Margaret and Michael Robson. She had a sister, Margaret, who was born in 1832, so two years after she was born, but Margaret only lived a couple months, sadly. And then she did have a brother that was born the following year named Robert. So during Mary's childhood, when she was eight years old, she actually moved to the village of Martin, which with her family in England. I believe it was Northern England. So it was later reported that her Sunday school teacher reported her as just being a regular average student with kind of below average intelligence in school. Nothing really out of the ordinary that you would kind of see in the typical serial killer fashion. If you look back at Ted Bundy and all of these other infamous serial killers, you can see a pattern in how they grew up. You know, know, very detached, no empathy, harming of their peers or animals, and none of that was really here. She just seemed like the typical kid. Soon after her family moved when she was eight, a couple years later when she was 10, her dad actually fell down 150 feet down a mine shaft and died while he was working in 1842 because being a miner was really popular and almost everyone had someone in their family family that worked in the mines during that time. Because her father actually passed away, their house was tied to his name. And so once he died, the family actually had to move because they were gonna get evicted. And really quickly, her mom actually ended up remarrying the next year in 1843, when Mary was 11, to George Stott, who was actually a fellow miner like her dad was. And at age 16, so now Mary is a teenager, and she actually left home to become a nurse at the nearby village called South Hetton. I believe I'm saying that correctly. Please let me know down below if I mispronounce any names or villages in the video. And when she moved out to become a nurse, she actually started living with Edward Potter, who was the manager of where she worked. So the next three years, as Mary was working as this nurse and trying to become a nurse, her siblings actually started to grow up and they were all sent to boarding school schools and that was when Mary decided to move back home to live with her stepfather George and work as a dressmaker. So there's really not much more about Mary's childhood you know she just grew up and there, there wasn't really much on her parents and her stepfather really when she was growing up but we're gonna kind of fast forward a little bit a couple years later when she starts to go into her first marriage. So at the age of 20 in 1852, Mary actually met a man whose name was William Mowbray. He was a colliery laborer and they really quickly moved to Southwest England. And before I go into the rest of their marriage, I just want to point out everything happens very fast with her marriages and having kids and her adulthood. It just, something would happen and not long after, like she'd get married or have another baby. So I just want to let you guys know that the timeline of events that I'm going to 
spew off in just a minute. It all happens really fast. So it was reported that their life together was pretty good for the first four years or so, you know, just a typical marriage. But it was actually later noted they had four or five children together and all of those children were dying very young when they were living in Southwest England, but none of their deaths were actually registered. Take that with a grain of salt. They did have, I believe, four children together while they were married. So the only birth record though was of their daughter, Margaret Jane, who was actually born in 1856. So Mary was 24 at this point. So once baby Margaret was born, they decided to move back to Northeast England where William worked as a fireman abroad a steam vessel sailing in Sunderland. And then they also had two daughters. The first daughter was born was named Isabella in 1858. And then two years later, their first daughter together, Margaret, actually ended up dying in 1860. And a lot of these deaths were from gastric fever, which was a big cause of a lot of deaths of children and adults back then. So now we have one child who had passed away, Margaret, and now there's Isabella, right? There was another daughter actually born in 1861, not long after Margaret had passed away. And this baby was a baby girl and she was actually named Margaret as well, Margaret Jane. And they had a son, John Robert, who was born in 1863. So a lot of these babies were a year, two years apart. So they're very close in age. And a lot of these children over the four marriages that Mary ends up having, she has like at least four or five children with each of these men. So by the end of this case, she has 13 children and four marriages. So she definitely stays busy. And so like I said, Robert was born in 1863. Both John and the second baby Margaret were born. They actually both died the next year in 1864 from gastric fever. Like I said, it was really popular back then. A lot of people were getting sick and dying from gastric fever, which is like lots of like stomach issues. And then in 1865, her husband, William, ends up dying from an intestinal disease. So a lot of deaths so far happening because of internal stomach diseases. And so once William ends up passing away, Mary actually ended up getting money for the death of her husband and now the death of her four children that had passed away. So back then, obviously, the money was very different and she actually got a payout of William's death. She got 35 euros, which is equal to about $3,000 in 2020 and two euros for her son's death. She definitely made sure that she got some money for their deaths. So we're going on to husband number two, which is George Ward. So soon after her first husband, William's death, she actually ended up moving to Seaham Harbor, where she struck up a relationship with Joseph Natras. So during this time, she still had three and a half year old daughter, Margaret, Margaret Jr. we'll call her, but she actually died of typhus fever, leaving her with only one of nine children she had birth so far. Like I said, after husband number one, she had only four children. And now with George, she had a couple more children. And there really wasn't much on a lot of the children because there were so many of them. It was kind of hard for people to keep up with what children were being born, what children were being alive and living and doing fine. And then what children were dying because a lot of it, their deaths weren't getting reported. So I just want to keep that in mind that a lot of the children just like, I'm not going to mention a couple of the children just because it was so hard to pick out what was true and kind of not true. So now it is at the end of 1866. So Mary was actually hired as a housekeeper for a man named James Robinson. So at this time, James's wife, Hannah, had actually recently passed away and he was a shipwright. A month later, when James's son, John had died from gastric fever, he turned to Mary, his housekeeper, to kind of comfort him and make him feel better because losing a child, you'd think, is a very sad and traumatizing thing. So Mary was there and they kind of connected and formed a personal bond and relationship. And surprise, Mary became pregnant. At this point now, Mary's mom had actually became really ill with hepatitis. So she immediately went to be with her mom and her mom started to get better, but she kept 
complaining of stomach aches. In the spring of 1867, her mom actually died at the age of 54, which is only nine days after Mary went to be with her. So she was getting better, but within this nine days that Mary was there, she just progressively got worse with stomach issues. So that same year, her stepdad actually ended up remarrying his neighbor who was a widow. Not long after her stepdad remarried this widow, her daughter, Isabella, actually ended up moving back in with Mary to be with her. And Isabella at that point started to develop some stomach issues and died. James had two children of his own at this point and his two children, Elizabeth and James Jr. actually died at around this time that Isabella died. So all three children were buried in April of 1867 and she did end up receiving a life insurance payout of five euros for Isabella and they actually ended up getting married together in the fall of 1867. So a couple months after they just buried three of their children and they did end up having children together. Their first child was named Margaret Isabella. I don't know why but Mary just loves the name Margaret and she was born in November but became ill three months later in 1868 and then they did have a second child not long after named George who was born in June of 1868. Which I just want to point out, I didn't realize until just now, but I don't know if Mary just named this son George because she liked the name or because she had a husband George. Let me know what you think about that. Maybe it was just a popular name back then, but so... At this point, James, the husband, started to become really suspicious of Mary continuously asking him to get life insurance. She kept pushing it and he was getting really suspicious of like why she kept insisting that he get life insurance policy. He actually discovered that she had run up debts of over 60 euros, which back then it was a lot. If you remember earlier, about 35 euros was $3,000. So 60 euros was like a couple thousand dollars in debt behind his back and had stolen more than 50 euros that James thought that she put in the bank. And he found out that Mary had been making the children pawn household items that had value so she could get money for them. So now it's about 1869. So at this time, Mary was living on the streets. There wasn't really much on what happened, but something happened and she was actually living on the streets. And her friend at the time, Margaret Cotton, introduced her to her brother Frederick who was a recent widower and had lost two children out of his four children that he had. So Mary quickly befriended Frederick and actually ended up moving in and kind of acted as a mother figure for the two children that he had, Fred Jr. and Charles. So March of 1870, Charles became ill and actually passed away which left Mary to console the griefing Frederick and soon her well, pregnancy began. Yeah, you heard that correctly. Now her 12th child was gonna be born. Definitely busy between her uh, husbands, if you know what I mean. So now September of 1870, they actually ended up getting married and their son Robert was born in early 1871. So at this point, Mary's about in her 40s and not long after marrying Frederick, she found out that her past lover, Joseph Natras, which if you remember earlier, I mentioned him, he was living about 30 30 miles away from where she was and he was no longer married and she wanted to rekindle their relationship and kind of see where it went and she persuaded her family to move near him. Obviously they didn't know that at the time. In December of 1870 Frederick actually died from gastric fever. She wasn't even married to Frederick for even a year before he died. So I just want to point out though Mary had a couple lovers throughout her marriage marriages. The true names of her lovers have not been confirmed, but Richard Quick Manning may have been the real name of her lover, not Joseph Natras. I just want to point that out. She did have some lovers, but some articles did say that the name Joseph Natras was not the correct name of this particular lover that she wanted to rekindle their relationship for. So while she was living with her lover now, she became pregnant with her 13th child, Frederick Jr., the one from 
Frederick's last living child actually ended up dying in 1872. And infant Robert, now her 12th child, died soon after that as well. And can you guess it? Surprise, surprise. Her lover then became ill with gastric fever and died not long after that, after he changed his life insurance recently over to Mary. You see a, a trend? You're picking up what I'm putting down. And she st was still at the time waiting to collect Charles's life insurance when her lover had died. So now I'm going to start talking about Mary's downfall and kind of what led to her getting arrested and put to death eventually. So her downfall really began when a parish official, Thomas Riley, asked her to help nurse a woman who was ill at the time with smallpox. She actually complained that the last surviving cotton boy was in her way and asked Riley if he could be committed to the workhouse. And Riley, who also served as the assistant coroner, said she had to accompany him. She told Riley that the boy was very ill and said, quote, I won't be troubled for long. He'll go like all the rest of the cottons. And five days after she said this, she told Riley that the boy had actually died. And so Riley was so kind of suspicious, obviously, and he went to the village police and convinced the doctor to delay writing a death certificate until the circumstances could be investigated because he didn't want the death certificate to be made and for Mary to get money for the life insurance, which was pretty smart if you ask me. The insurance office actually paid a visit to Mary after the boy's death. They told her that she wouldn't get any money for his death until the death certificate was issued. And so it went to court and the jury actually found that his death would be due to natural causes and therefore issued the death certificate. And it was later found out that Mary reported that she gave the boy arrowroot to relieve his pain and Riley had made accusations about Mary due to her refusing advances from him. So I think she was just kind of trying to cover her tracks and make Thomas Riley seem like the bad guy that it was his fault for accusing her of doing such a thing. And so at this time, the local newspaper had actually learned of Mary's history of death following her around. Because at this point, she had moved around Northern England a couple times, lost four husbands, a lover, a friend, her mother, and 11 children, all from stomach fevers. So a lot of rumors kind of started to arise about Mary and the suspicious deaths. And Dr. William Byers Kilburn had kept samples and tests showed that they contained arsenic, meaning that a lot of the people around her that had died had arsenic in their system when they died. And so he then obviously told the police that arrested Mary finally and they exhumed Charles's body to test that for arsenic as well. And so at this point she actually was charged with murder but the trial wasn't held until January of 1873 once she actually gave birth to her 13th child because when she was arrested and all of this suspicions were coming out she was still pregnant with her 13th child who she named Margaret Edith Quick Manning Cotton. Quite the name. So now her trial was underway in March of 1873. So at this time, Mary is 41 when she got arrested. So there was actually a delay in her trial because there was a problem in selection for the counsel. Charles Russell finally chosen as the lead prosecutor in Mary's case was one of the first famous many poisoning cases that he had worked on before. So when the defense was making their arguments, they argued that Charles had died from inhaling arsenic used as a dye in the green wallpaper of the Cotton's home. So the doctor ended up testifying that there was actually no other powder on the same shelf in the chemist's shop as the arsenic was the only liquid, though the chemist claimed that there were no other powders. The defense argued it was possible that the chemist had accidentally used arsenic powder instead of bismuth powder, I believe, which is used to treat diarrhea when preparing a bottle for the baby Charles. With all that being said, the jury returned deliberating for 90 minutes and they came back with a verdict of guilty. The Times correspondent reported in March, correspondent reported 
reported, quote, After conviction, the wretched woman exhibited strong emotion, but this gave place in a few hours to her habitual cold, reserved demeanor, and while she harbors a strong conviction that the royal clemency will be extended towards her, the staunchly asserts her innocence of the crime that she had been convicted of. And she was sentenced to life in prison, but she actually got the death penalty. And Mary was actually hanged at the Durham County Prison in March of 1873. So only being imprisoned for a couple weeks. And it was said that, quote, she died not from her neck breaking, but by strangulation caused by the rope being rigged too short, possibly deliberately. And she did end up passing away. Out of all of Mary's 13 children, only two actually ended up surviving. Margaret Edith and her son George from her marriage to James Robinson. This case was quite crazy. A lot of it happened so fast, like I said. And during her trial, it was just really noted that she lacked empathy. She didn't really seem very sorry. Obviously, she didn't confess. But I just don't know why she would do such a thing. I mean, yes, for the money. But like, was it really worth it just to get a little bit of money? That's such a horrible thing to think of a mother doing or even a daughter to her mother. It just amazes me these serial killers and like what would make them do all of these things that they do? Like is it from their genetics and how their brain is wired or is there something in their childhood growing up that just pushes them over the edge? It just fascinates me so much and I don't think I'll ever wrap my head around quite the extent of what they do. It's just insane. But yeah that is really all for this case today guys. I really hope you enjoyed this video. I really enjoy covering these serial killer cases. Let me know if you have any case recommendations or if you want me to do more true crime cases in the future. I'm totally open to it and please subscribe. It would really mean the world to me. And with that being said, I will see you in my next video. Bye!